There's no question that uh, education differs in different communities in this country. How do we make sure that uh, every person has a chance to take advantage of the skills and talents that God gave them? My nieces who go to school in Guilford, um, they're already reading and writing before they even get to kindergarten. The fact of the matter is our students are not performing where they should be. Parents say it's the teacher's fault, the teachers say it's the principal's fault. I think Amistad was created to debunk the notion that not all kids can learn. We will do whatever it takes to make good on the promise that all of our students are going to be headed to college. I think that we are really diehard fans of whatever it takes and no excuses. I think those two things, we have actually several mantras that we live by, those are two. Uh, and I think the no excuses really speaks to the mindset that we all need to have, not, for, not only for students, but for ourselves. What we have said in public education in this country overwhelmingly is we're going to fix time, right? A 180-day a school year, six hours and 15 minutes a day. And what therefore varies? Achievement. When you add, yes, actually nine. It's not multiplied. It's a long day. <laughs> I think that uh, it's something that is evolved in my time here, but I think a typical day would be a teacher coming in at 7.15 uh, to breakfast duty. We have a, effectively an eight and a half hour day and that that's what we're giving to every kid. And then on top of that, you will have kids who get additional time um, Saturdays, for example. We have Saturday tutoring programs. I think the very structured time frames that we have here are actually to best use instructional time and to best support kids um, and our scholars. My name is Jaden Valderrama. I'm from New Haven, Connecticut, and I'm 14 years old. I think education is a very big priority because we all take class is serious and we all try to learn new materials every day. My name is Carl Hodrick. Uh, my children go to Achievement First. Uh, my grandkids, Ramaya, Roshana, Rochelle, and Makai. Makai started in uh, first grade, and right around when the Achievement First opened. My name is Makai Buckley. I, I go to Achievement First, and I take, it, I take it personally, like, really well because it's part of my life. And Achievement First, I never heard of the school. I didn't know what it was. So I was kind of leery. I said, well, I don't want him in another failing school. And so I said, OK, we, it's got to be better than the one that he came out of. So we put him there. Every class that you walk into has an instructional aim that students are expected to master by the end of that class. Oh, I enjoy it most. Like, the teachers here, like, they, um, they really push us to do our best. And like, even though sometimes we might not agree with them, we know that what they're doing is really trying to prepare us for um, our future. And sometimes the discipline is hard on them, but we know if without discipline you can't teach. He had two hours worth of homework in, in first grade every night from Monday to Sunday, and we said, wow. So we saw a interest from playing in school to learning in school. All our students get every teacher's cell phone numbers, and they are expected to call us if there is a question about homework, if there's confusion about homework, and reach out to us and say, Ms. Lopez, I did not understand the writing assignment, the reading assignment for today. Can you go over it with me? You can call your teachers? Yeah. 
What do you say, what do you say when you call? You say, like, why am I failing? What do I have to do to make it up? Because often parents will say, well, they didn't get their homework done because they didn't understand it. Well, we've taken away that excuse. But we're fundamentally asking them to make sure their kids come to school every day ready to learn, um, to, to supervise and stay on top of their homework and their reading at night, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Parent says they missed the bus and we couldn't get them to school. We'll send a cab to their home and we'll have them come to school. So because of the success that Makai had and we seeing where he had grown academically, we just said, this is where the rest of them are from kindergarten. There was no doubt this is where they were going. The school is now going on its 14th year of debunking the idea that somehow uh, students from poor economic backgrounds or from a certain, because your skin is a certain color, you will not achieve at the same heights as our suburban counterparts. And we've just shown that that's not in fact true. We are working every day to prove that demography is not destiny, um, and that zip code is not destiny, that skin color is not destiny. One of the things I know about public schools, when the prison system decides how many beds they need, they go into a public school and look at who's learning. You know, middle class, upper middle class families, that um, parents will, and those communities will support, will create coherence for students, even if the education is disconnected. The kids know why they're there. They know what they're trying to get out of. They know why they're learning European history. It is different here, but that, that doesn't make it okay for us to say that, well, they're from, I mean, this is New Haven, Hartford, Bridgeport. You can't have the same expectations for, you have for the students in Madison and Greenwich. Well, that's, that's, that's not fair, and we, we, no one should, should, uh, should, should take that. Uh, to, to take that attitude, and we don't. So the question was, do you prepare your kids for jail, or do you prepare them for Yale? Over the last uh, 15 years, charters have emerged as a choice for, for parents and for students and for communities. I mean, people ask, do, does the union support charter schools in favor of <laughs> The fact of the matter is most folks don't realize they were our idea. I think charters are, are part of a solution for public education in the United States. However, that said, I don't think they're a substitute for excellence in our public school districts, and they, they should be seen that, uh, that way. That charter schools would be, quote, incubators of change places where the schools would be freed up from central office policies, union contracts, and they can try new and different things. Now we have a separate school system within the school system. Amistad is a public school. They, are, they, are, they take tax dollars. And to set up this elitist group within the public school system, because that, that's what it's become. It's become a question of the haves and have not. The charter schools will come in, and very often you know, they have to be funded as well. And that money has to come from somewhere. So some of the money that is dedicated for uh, the traditional public schools, New Haven, like the New Haven public school system, gets diverted uh, to those. Uh, so it's very often a, a question of, of funding. Five percent of our student population in New Haven arrives after October 1st every year. That's not a conventional classroom. It breaks our model of what education should look like. That's a huge impact to learning. I mean, imagine you're a classroom teacher, guidance counselor bangs on your door at 10 o'clock in the morning, they bring a student in, very often you don't have, have any records. Uh, I said with the student's reading level, their academic levels, any special needs that they may have. Uh, and that goes on all day, every day, all year long. And it's just, it's a huge challenge for us. So a, a place like Amistad, I mean, the teachers there work very hard and they get good results. You don't face the challenges with, that the New Haven public schools and other traditional public schools face. If a student doesn't fit in, at a charter school, those students are sent back to traditional public schools. It's a one-way street. Uh, and I will tell you this uh, for sure, 99% of those students that come back to us uh, are discipline problems. No, like, if we're demerits, like, you get demerits easily if your pencil drops, like. No, if your pencil drops, then you'll get it. That's automatic attention. What parents talk about is there's too much discipline in the school. Well, 
you know, when you look at the results of the discipline, then you can't argue with the success of it. 26 students won medals in gymnastics. 14 students won medals in both gymnastics and soccer. Let's hear from somebody who disagrees. Dorian? There is one compelling reason why teachers from the charter school system have come over to traditional union schools. And, and it, it essentially is you do what you're told or you, you have to leave. Uh, and, and the pressure is, uh, and it doesn't matter. If they need you at 5 o'clock at night, 6 o'clock at night, they need you on Saturday. It's not because we as adults want to work a longer school day or want to work a longer school year. It's because that's what we think is necessary for your child and we promise to be here every single day. A couple weeks ago when we had a huge storm and actually unfortunately school was closed for a week, teachers came in on Thursday and Friday when the roads were cleared and sent homework uh, home in packets or had uh, called parents and said please come and pick up some work so, so that while your students are at home not in school they can come in and get ahead in their reading. Basically what they need to do is whatever they're told to do so some of them despite being very hard workers they just you know this just just becomes too much so they, they they've opted out. If they are not actually effective as teachers they will work hard to develop you you're still not effective you should leave. So a, a lot of the charter school teachers are not part of a union, and it, and it does make their, you know, their sec security is, is, is limited at best, you know, their job security. When you look at that survey data and you pull it back and you ask people, um, do you imagine a long-term career with Achievement First? They're still saying, hmm, not so sure. In an environment where you have more customers and you have ability to serve, Amistad is overwhelmingly the number one choice in the city. Over 500 kids applying in kindergarten. Um, and if you don't live in the neighborhood or aren't a sibling, you're not getting in. And they'll argue, well, our kids go through the lottery system. Those are students whose parents are already engaged. They care about their kids' education. They go to the, get them enrolled in the lottery, fight hard to get them in a charter school. Parents are also the cheerleaders for students when students say, you know, that school is too hard or I can't do it or I don't want to go there. We say do not give up on, on us and do not give up on your child. Parents are hugely important to, uh, to kids' education and part of that is about what they teach kids before they get to school uh, with us and part of that is how they support the education uh, and the educational mission that's happening when students are in the K-12 system. It's cool to be smart because you get to learn things and you, you can get smarter and smarter and go to college. We have so many stories of fifth graders who come in who say, I hate this place, I hate the structure here, and then leave four years later, just changed people. When you do good in school, you usually have more friends because people want to hang out with you because you, you are smart and they want to um, like they want to start following your lead and become smart. and start paying attention more in class. And I think I think it's good to learn because if we if we were um, if we didn't learn, we we wouldn't even know how to sing our ABCs, write ABCs or um, count numbers like 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10. Um, and um, we wouldn't even know how to spell read. R E A D. <laughs> you can see not only that excitement learning inside the school, you can see how it affects the neighborhood. We don't believe any silver bullet to providing a good education. And we start with a one-on-one a -on -one meeting with every family once they're admitted and say, What's your, what are your hopes and dreams for your child? We can obviously change the trajectory and path for many of our students' lives. It doesn't happen for every student, and it doesn't happen in every classroom, and it doesn't happen in every school, and that's the challenge. But I do actually think it can happen.